Hello, everybody. Welcome to Modern Frontiersman, the podcast. I'm Josh. I haven't done an episode in a while, but we are bringing back a guest I had on several months ago, and uh, we got done recording and found out the audio quality was terrible. So here we, we are having him back on again. And uh, his fellow YouTuber uh, in the, the same uh, niche that uh, this Modern Frontiersman channel is in, DJ, the Metalhead Mercenary. Welcome, dude. Hey, brother. How you doing? Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. I'm glad to have you back on. I guess tell you before we start recording, I'm sorry it's taken this long. And I know there were several people that were looking forward to hearing you, and then it didn't happen. <laughs> hey, you know, life happens, technical difficulties, it's all good. Glad we could do it again. Yeah, so um, obviously, like I said, uh, you're in the same, you know, uh, YouTube sort of community as yeah. Like myself and everybody else that I've interviewed, the prepper slash minute man slash whatever you want to call it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, tell what tell can you tell everybody? Tell me about your channel. Like, well, like why do I got you on here? You know. Um. Well, we had uh yeah we had kind of connected again like through the community that's formed in the quote unquote underground, I guess when when it comes to YouTube and the uh gun tuber and prepared citizen kind of sphere um and uh my channel is is a hodgepodge i do all kinds of stuff um i do a lot of you know i do some diy project stuff uh, you know i sh cover cover things about uh bushcraft uh tips and tricks tools firearms uh discussion long form videos uh, a, a whole range of different things kind of within that broader topic and series of topics um, apart from doing other things is I also am a musician and an and artist and stuff. And then I talk about some of the professional segues as well that cross over from military service and do security contracting and things like that. So um, a lot of parallels, a lot of crossover and yeah, I just kind of, do whatever the hell I want. So it keeps it interesting. <laughs> yeah. Your channel is like, it's just kind of a, a mixture of all your interests. Huh? Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Just kind of a glimpse of me and more of a, 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 a personality, a personality, a personable manner than just uh, pigeonholing myself. Like, a, like what we see a lot of channels end up doing, um, which is why I like your channel and some of our, some of our other friends as well, because they do, you know, change it up and keep, keep things interesting and, and show them in a more, in a more personable manner, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's like I was telling Fatty, Fatty Westside when he interviewed me or when I interviewed him a few weeks ago, it's like, I'm, I'm trying to probably here in the next, my next few videos is not going to be so much minute man, but more like outdoors, you know, homesteading and the, the, frontiersman yeah. you know type of aspect of everything which goes along with it yeah absolutely that, yeah uh, but yeah i'm with you on that not not wanting to sort of specialize because you know in in the preparedness uh world you kind of have to be somewhat of a jack of all trades 100 percent, absolutely yeah. there's there's so many things if you're trying to be self-reliant that you know you got to learn how to do and do for yourself Yep. Yep. You know, you, yeah, you can't just focus on, on the boomsticks and, and doing, uh, you know, reconnaissance stuff, even though that's important, you got to know how to be a, how to be a carpenter, how to, how to garden, how to do everything sustainable for yourself. So, yeah. Right. So, um, can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. My mic did something weird again. I'm still there, right? <laughs> yep, you're good. All right, I'll edit all this out. But <laughs> I figured out what was doing it. But uh, anyway, uh, so can you, let's see. So how, how did, I don't remember what all I asked you the last time I was on here. But uh, I mean, roundabout. But um, so how, how did you grow up? You grow up like in a rural environment in a, in a city? Did you, you know, hunting, fishing, self-reliant? type stuff or or what um actually i had a pretty i guess interesting childhood um i moved around a lot every couple of years 
probably about average every three years or so I moved around. Um, my dad was an accountant and a plant manager bouncing around a, a bunch of different like large companies. Um, so I've lived all over the Midwest, uh, uh, Iowa, Texas, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, a couple other States, uh, just, just all over the place. And, uh, so you know, made some friends along the way. It was kind of hard to keep friends though, just cause I was moving so much and, you know, just wasn't able to visit old friends that I would make, you know, as time went on and, and moved around and stuff. But, uh, one of the, one of the constants was, was family in general. Um, my mom's dad. So my grandpa, my mom's dad, was the one who taught me how to how to shoot and hunt at an early age probably starting at about seven years old with bb guns and 22s and stuff going out shooting shooting hunting for squirrel and rabbit and shooting shooting crows that were eating his crops and things like that he was a big big gearhead uh he drove a a fuel truck for the greater area where he lived for and you know fueling up farmers equipment and things like that and he also drove a uh, grain grain semi for years for farmers locally but uh he was a very handy guy he's still alive but unfortunately he has severe dementia now but um he, he was a very handy guy and he taught me a lot and my dad taught me a lot too my dad definitely much more of the conservative type although not really any interest in firearms or anything like that my mom a little bit more of the free spirit um and of course with her upbringing you know she was a little more a little more privy to firearms but still not like a big gun person or anything but uh but my parents uh they they, they taught me a lot they i had a good upbringing even though i moved around a lot it was taught taught early on the importance of good work ethic and pushing myself and learning useful, useful skills for myself to uh, take care of myself in the future. Everything from and with my grandpa as well, being able to, you know, change the oil on my vehicle and do basic plumbing maintenance on, to on my toilet, you know, change the light bulbs, you know, all that stuff, how to balance a checkbook, like things like that, that you're not taught in school or anything like that, even though my high school, was good about it had an auto shop class and stuff but but uh yeah it was just a lot of that moving around a lot but but the constant was family and i have a lot of family who's law enforcement as well and stuff so i've always been kind of around that culture and some some family who's military on and off through the years one of my dad's my dad's from a big family one of his brothers was a uh, uh, military police for the air force during the first gulf war and uh couple of cousins two of my cousins my two cousins that are older than me went into the military and i followed their footsteps too um so and there's some family history there and i'm a big history nerd too my my mom's dad my grandpa uh also a big history nerd so he taught me a lot about history and stuff too uh in the in the early years as well so it, pretty well-rounded upbringing um albeit relatively unstable just because of moving so much so there wasn't any guarantee that <laughs> I would have, I would have uh, long, st long standing friends along the way, even though I've stayed in contact with some of them now, thanks to how the internet is, but, uh, but, but good, good skills and good upbringing though. So. All right. Cool. So, um, so you ended up going into the army. So what brought you into the army? Yeah. So freshman in high school, when nine 11 happened, and uh, we, we were watching that live as it unfolded on TV. There was, this, there was this little short class in between our second and third period in my freshman year called like steps class or something like that. I don't know. Some kind of like student development type class. But they wheeled these TVs in because, you know, word went out that something was happening in New York. And I was living in the Midwest and we watched it live. We watched the second plane hit the second, you know, the second tower and everything. And a lot of us instantly knew that things were going to change. We were old enough to understand what was going on. And ever, you know, some of my buddies started started yell, running out in the halls and yelling, "We're going to war!" And uh, yeah, kind of that kind of solidified it from there. Apart from you know, again being a being a big history guy too, it was something that was always in the back of my mind about something I may may want to do in the future 
And then once that happened, it kind of made up my mind that uh, that would be a path I would go after high school. So graduated high school in 05 and I was working two jobs and had an internship when, uh, even before graduating high school, but graduating high school, I, I was working jobs and stuff. So I did that for the summer and had, had my fun, you know, partied, hung out with my friends and everything. And, and then, uh, end of summer, I, I went into the recruiter and told him I wanted a infantry and special operations contract and, and they, they hooked it up. So. So why, um, you know, it's like uh, Fatty asked me the same question. You know, why I chose the Marine Corps? Why did you choose the Army over any other branch? I think part of that was just history and just growing up seeing, you know, Audie Murphy and John Wayne movies and seeing movies like Black Hawk Down and all that. And, um, <laughs> you know, and uh, yeah. my my dad's dad, so my, my other grandpa, my dad's dad, he had served in the Army right around Korea, right around that time frame, like right – right at the end and right after Korea. I have a sneaking suspicion he was actually one of the atomic troops that were involved with some of the uh, some of the line unit uh, personnel that are out there during the nuke testing in the desert and stuff. And he didn't ever really talk about what he did in the Army, even though he, he didn't make it past PFC. So, But, um, and he died of, he died of some really crazy, rare, incurable cancer, you know, years, years later. Um, yeah, when I was, when I was younger, um, but, uh, you know, yeah, just between, just between media and, and, and just the history and, and other family members that have been in the army, I was like, okay, this is probably where I'm going to go. I thought about the Marine Corps. I even thought about the Navy too. Cause I do, I, I grew up, I grew up sailing too. My dad really likes sailboats. So we had a little, just a small 16 foot Monarch sailboat that we would go sailing the lakes on. And uh, uh, other friends who had sailboats and stuff. So I had always been on the water a little bit too. So that was that was something I thought about too. But but with the army, I was like, you know, Green Berets and Rangers, like that's the way, you know, for me. So I uh, I walked into my recruiter off uh, into the local army recruiter office, and I was like, I want infantry, and put me in for a special operations contract, special forces contract. And he's like, you're sure? I'm like, yep. And then. Uh, did the uh, initial PT test with the recruiter and I did very well on that because I was a pretty athletic kid and uh, I was in shape and everything. So they, they worked their magic and, and got me that contract. Heck yeah. So what is, what does that mean? What are you, uh, so you were a ranger? No. So uh, story is um, so uh, army infantry. So I served at the U S army's third infantry division mm -hmm. uh, first of the 30th. Anybody out there from uh, Kelly Hill knows knows uh, knows the deal there. I had uh, I had gone into the army on an eleven X ray contract, which is the special forces elective contract with the start going through infantry school and, and doing infantry with with Green Beret special forces. Contrary to Rangers, like Rangers, you can go the pipeline straight from infantry school to airborne school and then right to, uh, it was still called RIP at the time, Ranger Indoctrination Program. Now it's called RASP, Ranger Assessment and Selection Program. Or you do infantry and and then you, you serve for a couple of years and then you go do special operations because they usually don't like to pull people right at 18 years old for Green Berets. Um, yeah. Just, they want that maturity and that ex a, for you to get a little bit of experience first. So yeah, that was absolutely. like, you just can't go straight to Force Recon Marine Corps. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, so I was going that pipeline. I was going to go the Green Beret pipeline and uh, things didn't really work out that way. Um, firstly, so 2005, you remember, you know, Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Sandy happened. We're like back to back basically. You know, and uh, so that slowed everything down, not only on Fort Benning for infantry school, but also uh, all across the south, the southeast and the south and in the east coast. Um, so some of the special operations cycles were pushed back uh, a period of time as well. But that was that was just initially uh, down the line. That wasn't a problem. But I got injured while serving with my infantry unit on deployment and then I had to get uh uh, transferred to a different unit and ended up uh, went from the third infantry division after my injury went from the third infantry division to 
at the time what was called SHU or uh, STHU. It was a uh, part of TRADOC. It was a special. It was a it was a, a special training program program for uh, training cross training with coalition units and also working with some of the special events stuff um, like uh, 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 international sniper competition and things like that for like staffing for that and things like that and being assistant cadre for s different things. So I ended up doing that and then right in uh, the beginning of 2008, like just four or five months before I got out of the army, TRADOC split that up and that coalition training program got moved somewhere else. And then there was the RHU, which was a retrain and hold unit for guys who got injured and were reclassing or guys that were getting medical boarded out. Like it was a unit that kind of compiled a bunch of those guys together that were kind of in a holding pattern and ended up working uh, some administrative stuff for them um, and helping uh, with processing with that and stuff apart from being in that unit because I was getting a medical board out. Mm -hmm. So I had, I had a three and a half year contract four years with the, the amount of TDY that I had built up and everything paid TDY and everything that get, they got to pay out. And then, you know, with the IRR set up and everything as it was. So ended up doing that for the last like six months, six months that I was in the army. Um, after, after my infantry unit had to, had to put me somewhere else just cause they didn't have room for me and I was injured and it was going to take me a while to heal. So. Right. Didn't so get to. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was, I was, I was just gonna, just gonna say I didn't get to, didn't get to do the whole pipeline, unfortunately, that I wanted to do. But that's a, that's okay. I got, I still got good experience out of it and got to do a bunch of cool things and meet a bunch of cool people. So. Right, right. So you deployed to Iraq when you were in the infantry, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. What what year was that? So that was uh, two thousand and seven, uh, and our our unit went to Fob Falcon which was uh, southwest of Baghdad, uh -huh. um, fairly big fob. Um, so it, it, we, what was our, our handoff was either from 4th ID, 4th Infantry Division from 06, 4th ID handed off to us, or the 101st Airborne did. I can't remember, honestly. It was either, it was either 4th ID handed off to us or 101st handed off to us, and then we handed off to 4th ID or the 101st when we were done. I can't remember exactly. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. Um, I couldn't remember who we relieved or anything either. <laughs> right, you know, and uh, but it was cool because like we were there. Third ID was there, Fob Falcon, and then we had Fifth Special Forces Group and the SIF, the Commanders and Extremist Force. Actually, uh, Mike Glover, you know, Fieldcraft Survival, all that. Mike Glover, his SIF units. Um, those guys were in and out of our Fob every once in a while too. But uh, funny story with that, my cousin was in Fifth, Fifth Special Forces Group. One of my older cousins was in 5th group, 5th Special Forces group, and he was at the same FOB at the same time, in and out, which was really cool. And I was like, I know yeah. we saw each other, even though we didn't, like, link up, you know, and hang out or anything. It was like, I knew, like, we knew we were, each other were there, so it was kind of funny. Yeah, it's like, I've wondered, too, like, did I, I, I wonder how many times I actually saw Jocko Willing not knowing, <laughs> you know what I mean, that, like, <laughs> later on, it's going to be huge. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Task Force, the Task Force Bruiser guys, yeah, dude. Because <laughs> we, I know we ate in the chow hall next to them all the time, and I was like, I, I'm trying to think back now. You know, there's no way I could, you know, possibly have picked him out. You know, like now. But... <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I was like, like, I probably, I probably like sit right next to that dude in the chow hall. <laughs> <laughs> right. I know uh, everyone looks different now too. You know, we're all older and stuff, and it's like, man. But talking to my cousin, because uh, I actually, I actually work part time for his company that he has now, but um. Uh, as a as a uh, an assistance personnel and subcontractor for his company, um, but he was he was the fifth group guy, and and we were talking, you know, years later we reconnected and stuff, and I was like, dude, dude we were we were at the same fob at the same time. What the hell? Like, <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> so, um, so what was your deployment like? Um, so was it uh, was it pretty eventful or no? Or it, it was extremely eventful. Um, so, so 2007, that was the spin up for the uh, Iraqi presidential election. If you, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you remember or not, but, um, yeah, I remember because we yeah. got back and I was thinking yep. it was, we were kind of glad we probably weren't there anymore because thinking they're probably going to get pretty, 
Yep. It was pretty heated. Yeah, it got it was it was bad. It was bad. So there was the spin up for that, and then uh, just Sauter City. So like in the north uh, northeast uh, kind of region of Baghdad, Sauter City was was popping off like crazy. And then uh, out of Fob Falcon, we had we had regional control um, over a pretty sizable area. Um, now, was that region predominantly Sunni or Shia? So predominantly uh, Sunni, because mm-hmm. yeah, that was the majority in Baghdad's majority Sunni. Um, so yeah, F- Fob Falcon, Fob Falcon on the on the southwest uh, uh, corner of Baghdad there. So I mean, we were. We were dealing with Route One, and then we were also, you know, obviously we were dealing with Route Irish and everything from from uh, from Biaf, from Baghdad International and everything, and and then up into Sadr City, the large northeast quadrant. We were dealing with all of Baghdad really, but but also our extension was out on Route One down to like Rashid, uh, Al Musafar, um, uh, Abu Amir, um, even as far out as like. Uh, uh, close to like Abu Ghraib and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, we had we had a pretty pretty good size area. I mean, the Third Infantry Division is is a massive is a massive division. You know, it's a large infantry division, and uh, uh, yeah, we just we're one of the I should, probably the most deployed active duty infantry unit for the army because um, mm-hmm. we literally deployed every other year. That like that, that division deployed like every other year, and and did so up until basically the the end of Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, OIF and OEF and everything. Um, but it was every other year. Um, but we had a yeah, we had a. I mean, there was a lot of us, I and mean, it wasn't we weren't just in FOB Falcon either. We were we were kind of split up between a couple of of major outlying FOBs and, and bases and stuff, apart from operating a BIAP and everything and. And then all of the uh, OPs and CPs that we set up and everything. So uh, we had we had a stretch. We had a stretch of area. Um, but a lot of my experience was definitely in and around Baghdad and Sadr City and stuff. Um, a little a little bit of like uh, Radwania and stuff too, which is again that, that southwest area, the southwest region, and Abu Amir and everything um, within the Baghdad area. So a lot of that, but we were in, we were in Sutter city constantly and yeah, it was, it was bad because you had the, you had the election spin up the presidential Iraqi presidential election spin up. And then you had the, Oh God, there was so many, you, you know, all the different like insurgent factions that are, that were out there, you know, like, um, Oh yeah. The, the Al Maktar or whatever, whatever they, yeah, I think it was Al Maktar. And then the, you know, Mahdi army was still floating around a little bit. You had Zarqawi's ISIS that was kind of mm-hmm. floating around a little bit. Cause people don't realize like I, Zarqawi started ISIS in 04, you know? Yeah. Um, and Sardar city was a hotbed for Zarqawi's Zarka- ISIS contingents uh, earlier on um, in 307 and stuff. And then uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Mahdi army, a, a bunch of other stuff. What was that? Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Well, no, that's no. what I was saying. Yeah, about the different factions and stuff. People don't realize that, you know, how I think we talked about that the last time where it's like, yeah, it's not these clear defined lines of who's who, you know, like there's there's a yep. ton of different groups of people fighting Americans plus each other. They don't have the same objectives. They don't yep. have the same mindset. It's a lot yeah. of different people fighting for a lot of different reasons. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of the, uh, even a lot of like the Al Qaeda guys were looking at Zarqawi's ISIS guys were like, whoa, hey, you guys are extreme, you know, like it, it was yeah. bad. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, there's so many different factions of little is, you know, insurgent cells that would band together. And then, and then you had the regional basically warlords, you know, mm-hmm. the, the militia, the militia leaders, the warlords all over the place. And like, you knew that it was a militia warlord because they had like, a huge house and a really well manicured lawn and everything yeah. where like no one else did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so. Big time shakes and stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's, that's something people don't think too. Like look, some of those militias and stuff, like they hate also hate Islamic extremists, you know, and also yeah. hate us too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It was, yeah. At any time, at any time it was like a five front 
you know, conflict. Like it was crazy because yeah, they were fighting each other and they were fighting us. And, and then you had the foreign fighters in there too. And, and, uh, yeah, I think it was, I think it was just like a month, just like a month before our unit got there, there was a really big engagement just out, just, just West more towards like, uh, 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 Fallujah and stuff. And, uh, there was some Chechens and stuff that they had captured. Well, I was they, just about to ask if you ever heard of anybody catching any Chechens because they yeah. were in Ramadi for sure. Yep. Yep. Uh, I wouldn't say captured. I mean, they captured their corpses, you know, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, they were there, you know, they had their IDs and, and it was, it, and and there were, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, and there, and there were Yemenis, there were Jordanians, there were Libyans, there were, there were even some, uh, some sub-Saharan Africans that we caught there, some Somalis and otherwise, um, yeah. you know, Syrians and stuff like, yeah, they were, they were, uh, Saudis, like they were pouring in from everywhere to come into Iraq to fight us, right? Um, and and link up with their other either AQI connections or even Iranian connections because the Iranians were there too. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know they always have interests in Iraq. Uh, yep, but uh, hey, speaking of which, I know this is kind of off topic, but something that people might not, you know, just a little interesting fact. I don't know if y'all ever you know, looked out for this, but I'm sure you're, you know, you're aware that most Iraqis are not bearded, or most Iraqi men don't have beards. Yeah. And I always heard, you know, Iraqi soldiers, and, and we kind of took that into consideration, too. If you see somebody with a beard, they're likely an Islamic extremist. They're likely ISIS yeah. or Al-Qaeda or something like that, because yeah. most, your average Iraqis don't have beards. A foreign fighter or whatever yeah no absolutely yeah <clears throat> the iraqis love their magnum pi mustaches you know <laughs> yeah. they totally look like they're stuck in the 80s <laughs> yeah no totally totally <laughs> <laughs> their clothes their hairstyle their mustaches <laughs> yeah yeah it was it was it was great because like my dad like when I was younger my dad had a mustache like that going on so it was it was kind of funny I was like man you, you look like my dad it was funny yeah but uh straight yeah straight Magnum PI dude it was crazy yeah. as a matter of fact the, the video that me and Fatty premiered today I don't know if you saw that one picture of me yep. with the Iraqi soldier with the mustache yep yep <laughs> yeah I watched it that was great <laughs> that dude was awesome his name is Abdullah and I found that picture the other day and I took it. I took a picture of the picture and sent it to Fatty because I was like, because I was sending a bunch of pictures to use for that. And I was like, oh man, I, I haven't seen that dude's face in so long. I wish, I wish I could find him to this day because he was so, like, he was one of the nicest people I've ever met in my life. <laughs> yeah, I, wish, I wish I had his number or email address or something so I could find yeah. him. Yeah. Man, <laughs> yeah. That's, it's crazy because um, one of our interpreters, um, we just called him Abu. His name was like Abu Muhammad, something, something, something. Like it was a long name. We just called him Abu. He was cool with it. He was a really solid dude. Um, really good interpreter. And uh, he understood He understood being an, an interpreter in that way where like, you know how like, especially in the Arab world and like Iraqis, like they'll tell you what you want to hear a lot of the time, not, not necessarily what you need to hear, you know, like kind of like that. But like he was really good about being able to – separate and delineate like how to translate us to them and then them to us and everything to make it make it as helpful and accurate as possible in getting through a lot of like the the takia fluff and everything um right. he was really cool though but uh unfortunately ours he was killed in man i think it was 24 it was 2012 or 2014 by isis um so he had gone, he had gone further west, like Missoula and stuff, and ended up being killed out there, unfortunately. Um, right. Really good dude, though. Yeah, it was good. It was a good time. He was really cool. He was he was really cool. Yeah, that sucks, you know, for interpreters like that, and, you know, because like they know good and well they're putting their life on the line when we leave, especially if they're Iraqi, you know, that they're going to have to stay there, you yeah. know, and, and and be a target. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, going, going back after the, the craziness of the GWAT going back as a contractor and, 
and seeing how things changed, especially like in Baghdad and everything, like the 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 normalization or the the trying to rebuilding it back to normal was actually a really positive thing to see. Um, mm-hmm. Because the, the Iraqis do have a lot of pride in their country, which rightfully yeah, so, yeah. you know, and uh, it, it made me happy to see that and, and made made really good connections and ate really good food. And, you know, it, it's, you know, it's just one of those it's just one of those things with a, with a war torn country and, and seeing 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 and hearing people's feelings towards it, the local feelings towards it. And then what they're, what they're doing afterwards to, to make things better for themselves and and live a good life. You know, it it was, it was, it was pretty, uh, it was pretty motivating to see because definitely a stark contrast to Afghanistan. (laughs) Right. Right. That's like, I was telling, uh, like I was talking to Fatty, you know, I was like, I wish I could go back to Ramadi and I was watching a video um, from Ramadi the other day, it was like some news saying it was from a few months ago, but you know, it's like I wasn't even looking at the same city anymore. You know, it's like, and there's like, you know, malls are open up, people are out having ice cream, you know, walking down the streets. Like, I was yeah. like, it almost brought me to tears because I felt so happy to know that, that that place was rebuilt to that level. You know what I mean? Like, I, was, I feel yeah. like so happy for the people there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, it, yeah. It was stark contrast in Baghdad, too. Like, just just seeing how how it improved over the years i mean obviously they still have a lot of political turmoil there right now the iranians are still kind of subversively you know poking poking at iraq to try and assert some semblance of power and you know with their 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 backed uh backed political leaders and 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 such but overall yeah it's 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 nice to see uh, a return of normalcy to an extent for them. You know, it's, uh, you know, thriving businesses. There's just, there's just one place that's, that's not far from Baghdad airport. Um, But it's like, it's like a massive, like rotisserie chicken place, like roast chickens. Um, Man, it's really good. (laughs) It's good food. But like the businesses like that are thriving. Like there's a, there's this other place. I forget what it's called. Um, but they do like fish, like fresh caught fish and a bunch of other stuff. Like that place is, it's almost like a fine dining establishment, like restaurant, like they're doing well. The hotels are doing well. Like, you know, things are, things are picking up for them, which is good to see. So. Yeah. So when's the last time you were in Iraq? So that would have been 20, 20, 2012. Oh, okay. So it's been a while, not recent. I'm going to say, I'm going to think, yeah, because I went back to college 2013, 2015. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it would have been like 2012. Um, yeah. Cause working as a contractor uh, back if, uh, on and off on the WIPS Worldwide Protective Services contract. Um, so I went back a couple of times for that. And then, uh, work some other contracts as well. And then I was doing executive protection in central and South America on and off too, going back and forth. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's been a while, but even then, even then the rebuilding was already happening and everything, which was cool. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, you did, some, <clears throat> you did executive protection in South America. On that? Yep. Yep. So I've done, uh, executive protection for, uh, executive, uh, private businesses, executive private clients in Mexico, uh, Colombia, Honduras, and El Salvador. Okay. So down there with, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I should mention this, but what's his name? Uh, dang it. You know, the Bone Tactical. Oh, <laughs> yeah. He's over in Honduras. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not that guy. Gonna, I'm not going to get into that <laughs> unless you want to. Yeah. No, no, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> laughter laughter is the uh, appropriate response to that guy <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> but uh yeah so uh like we talked about last time we tried this about um people wanting to get into contracting like that like what yeah. what would you say to people who want to do security contracting um it's it's complicated because there's a lot of different 
facets of the industry as a whole. Um, it's very much a, a crawl, walk, run kind of thing as much as it is who you know and what skills you bring to the table, what experience you bring to the table. When it comes to uh, government contracts, so Worldwide Protective Services, even Federal Protective Service, which is much more a domestic contract, um, and a number of the other uh, defense-oriented contracts uh, with the government and otherwise, they want military experience. Uh, typically at least one combat or expeditionary deployment uh, in, in some kind of applicable uh, MOS, be it combat arms or MP or whatever. And then other contracts, are what are called OGA contracts, other government agency contracts. So that's like the higher level stuff, not only in Worldwide Protective Services, but also getting into like agency work, like GRS, like what Sean Ryan and some of those guys have done. Um, you know, the Benghazi guys, those are all GRS guys. Um, you can get into that uh, through WIPs with the Diplomatic Security Service, but also if you're much more of a higher level force recon, ranger, you know, special forces, SEAL, whatever, then, then you can do like the GRS stuff and whatnot. But there's a lot of different angles to it. And uh, some contracts don't have that high of a requirement, but they may not necessarily be an overseas contract. Um, apart from just whatever else, you know, when it comes to executive protection and things like that, you don't have to have any kind of military background for that. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a class I've been thinking about going to, uh, about an hour north of me in Huntsville, Alabama. Sure. Cause that's, to, I thought about getting, you know, license and everything to do a little bit of that myself. It, you know, it's, it, the, the training itself is worth it. And the, the certifying process, I'll say this, with a lot of the training companies out there that do quote-unquote certifying and stuff for executive protection work, again, there's a lot of ways to get into that industry. Um, I got into it by just knowing people and, you know, kind of proving to them that I had the skills to do it. Um, but uh, with the training and certification pipeline with these various companies, um it can be a good way to do it. And a lot of the time they do have a lot of resources to help facilitate you applying, networking with and applying to companies for work. Um, but at the same time, sometimes they don't really offer a whole lot for people in the competitive nature that it, that it is trying to apply and work in that industry, you know, um, experience matters, but, you know, obviously everyone has to start somewhere. Um, so if you don't have a, a military or law enforcement background, you know, having a minimum of say five years of armed security is usually a good, a good standing, uh, standard to have as far as a base requirement to get into the work. Um, <clears throat> and then on top of that, doing training and getting certifications, um, again, it's kind of, it's kind of a gray area because some of those certifications really don't mean anything besides saying it's you've completed a course, you know, um, there's certifications, actual certifying that you can do through like ACES, the American Society for Industrial Security, um, which is a, basically the premier organization for uh, private sector uh, security standards, uh, training, certif certifications, things like that. Like that's one way to go. Um, is through that certification pipeline. Um, otherwise, with the training companies, if they're ACES certified and things like that to be doing these certificates, like that's more legitimate than just a certificate of completion of a course, you know? So it's like that, that nuance is different. Um, and one is definitely much more applicable and, and is going to work much more in your favor on a resume and when applying to companies or um, networking with people for, for gigs over just a certificate of completion saying you've done this course. Cause that doesn't really, it doesn't really bring as much to the table if you don't have any applicable experience to come with it. So it's very right, much so now, like different, different States have different laws on that. Right. Like, so like in Alabama, if I understand correctly, you have to be certified and licensed to work in any, as in, in any sort of security job. Yes. Yeah. A lot of states are like that. You have to, a, a lot of states prefer that you have uh, the, the state security licensing 
and it does vary to what type of licensing by state. Because I know like Florida has like six different levels of or classes of certification for licensing. And my state is just one type, you know, mm -hmm. so um, which I have I have my security license for my state and everything. Um, but uh, it, 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 yeah, it depends. And then like some states, some states you have to have the company sponsor you to have a, an additional security firearms permit to carry apart from like your personal CCW permit or whatever you have for the state. Um, yeah, it is very, very nuanced by state with that kind of thing. Once you get out of the country and you're doing stuff, it's very different. Right. When you're, yeah, when you're working government contracts overseas and stuff, your licensing and credentials and everything are on the the CAC or or PIV, PIV or CAC uh, card, very much like a military ID card. Uh, your CAC, um, it's very much similar to that that you get that you have to have with you when you're when you're working and stuff. Like that's your that's basically your credentials and everything right there. Like you don't, you don't have anything else like license wise showing, you know, that you're licensed or anything apart from that you're with this company, you're on this visa and you have this identification and that's it. Um, and with executive protection in the, in the completely private sector side of things working wherever outside of the country, it's even less than that, you know? Um, Cause there's no like, for Europe, it's different uh, as far as like European companies and, and how they do things. It's different. But like for the U.S., there's no like international security license that you get, you know. So it ends up being quite the bit, quite a bit more fringe uh, uh, and gray area once you get into yeah, doing it, it like that. Way. If you were in a country that had very little laws, it probably wouldn't really matter. Would it? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. And it's. <laughs> It, it, and if and if there's there's good if there's good rapport between your client, you know your client, and and if they're working for a company, but like your client, and then whatever the corporate extension is in that country, and their relationship with local security and law enforcement, I think that always goes a long way um, as far as uh, uh, applicability to be able to to do things that you need to do and all that. Um, otherwise you have to build relationships or, or use handlers and fixers, you know, people to help you get things and, and to help facilitate things, sometimes get you paperwork that you need to operate in that country, things like that. So yeah, it can get, it can get a little convoluted. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask you, I've heard, and I know there might be other people, other veterans, you know, that hear this, that have the same question but yeah. i've heard and i think it might have been from another youtuber i think it was a bigger youtuber who does security contracting but uh can't remember his name but it said that a lot of those companies want sort of like fresh experience like if you've been out for a long time you're probably not going to get the job is that the case like being that i've been out for so long could i would it be would that be a problem if i were to go try to work for for a company like that um not necessarily, no. Um, have especially especially with uh, a military background that has combat or expeditionary deployments and stuff, and any other applicable work. And it doesn't even have to be other security work. It can be a number of other types of work where you've been a manager, for example, and things like that. Um, to include any degree, college degrees that you have, like you know, associates, bachelors, or whatever. Like all of that. It is good. It looks good on your resume and does provide you the ability to be competitive in the talent pool. Um, right. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing, you know, especially if you can, uh, if you can, if you can show proficiency in your KSAs, your knowledge, skills, and abilities, you know, you're good to go um, through, uh, through any, uh, process that they may have of, of of screening or testing you or anything um right. i'd I like you, the thing that's held me back in alabama from from doing that course and getting certified for security and everything yeah. is you know, the, from the course contents that i've looked at and stuff it's all like you know like weapon safety and stuff like that and i know that stuff is necessary but yeah. you know you know you know what i'm saying like with when you've got the background that would just be that would be annoying <laughs> a, a lot does not change from the military there is a lot of redundancy yeah <laughs> it's uh 
and it's like uh, like the whips con the worldwide protective services contract and stuff like it is a redundancy i mean you have a physical fitness test you have to do periodically um you have uh weapons requalification uh ours is like a three month on one month off rotation so it's usually in the uh, after you get back from that one month off of the rotation you're doing requalification again um so you're doing it like every four months basically um and that's and that's you know uh, rifles so m4 ak your pistols uh so like beretta m9 uh glocks um whatever else they have um and then uh, your your uh, uh, shotguns usually are 870 uh, shotgun, and then your crew serve weapons. So like your your saw, RPK, PKM, 240 Bravo, M2 machine gun, Mark 19, all that stuff. Dishka, um, all that stuff. And you do that requalification every couple of months. So there there's there's redundancy there, and you know that's that's that doesn't change, but it's something that you're used to as well. Having the military experience, like it's something you're used to, which is another reason why they like people having that experience. Because you're already used to that, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I just like, you know what I'm saying about like going to do that. Like you would, I guess, knowing that you already have these, this knowledge and skills, it would just yep. be kind of annoying to me to have to prove it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and, and <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Because well, and and that's something that's changed over time. Because there were guys that were weaseling their way into those contracts, like early on in the GWAT and stuff, that didn't have any background, and yeah. it caused problems. Oh, I um, that, yeah. which is which is why they started doing that kind of assessment and vetting process. You know, um, yeah. it's necessary for at least for those kinds of contracts. It's necessary. Um, yeah. So it's just like, you know, you know your stuff, play the game, do the things, you know, yeah. when they ask you to, and you're good to go. <laughs> right. I might do it then. <laughs> yeah, why not? Yeah. You know, it's good money. Private private sector is good money. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, like, a lot of people, when they find, like, people that I know personally, or like people around here, when they find out that, I have my YouTube channel, like that, and the preparedness, and you know the Minuteman stuff, and all the all the things that we thought about. Yeah, uh, they think, well, what's the point? You know, like that's that's stupid. What are you, you know, like are you paranoid? What do you think is going to happen? So, <laughs> and, and I always tell people, and, and you may you may agree with this, or I guess I'm just asking, can you you know kind of give your thoughts on this? Some of us who have been to other places in the world and seen what is possible in societies, you know, what's possible to happen, I feel like we see more of a, a of a necessity for that that people can't see that don't have that experience and haven't seen those things that have been kind of yeah. isolated in a bubble within this country. I mean, would you agree with that? Actually, yeah, 100%. I do. Um, that, that was very well put, actually. I do agree with that. Not only the experience of, of seeing what happens in, in another country with total destabilization and breakdown of everything and lack of the simplest things like clean water, um, it, is, it is something that people need to take into account. And I say it a lot, too, on my channel, too. It's like, hey, guess what? What's the most common thing that happens that destabilizes communities and regions in this, in this country? Natural disasters, mm -hmm. you know? Tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, wildfires, you name it. That causes that same kind of havoc that people need to be prepared for. And that preparedness crosses over into more extreme and exigent circumstances like war. Um, right. I mean, we see how people acted, you know, like during the whole COVID deal, like from the shutdowns and then the George Floyd stuff. And it's like everything just kept escalating. It's like people were getting more and more angry. And more and more antsy and started acting more and more crazy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It, it, people are losing their damn minds. Like <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's crazy to see. And when the, uh, the riots happened back in 2020, I was on a, I was on a contract um, domestically. Uh, so I, it was, I had two roles in that contract. So I was, I was working on what's called a federal protective service contract but I was also still on a reserve ERT, an emergency response team with the global de global deployment status. Um, 
uh, uh, kind of in that PM in that PMC capacity, still uh, uh, an emergency response team. And I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that a little bit too, uh, after I talk about the riots. So with the riots, I was on duty when the riots kicked off in my city and I was at a site that was less than a block from the main foot traffic thoroughfare where everything was getting destroyed and burned up and everything. And I was by myself at, at this site. Our, our shift, our, our, our region lieutenant and everything did not deem it necessary to add additional force protection to the site based on the location and the situation that was happening uh, to provide extra personnel. So I was there by myself the entire night. And then uh, <laughs> that was, that was eventful. I, uh, I definitely uh, chased off a lot of people. Um, <laughs> right. And uh, I, thankfully, thankfully it didn't uh, get kinetic, but uh, it, there was, there were several times where I had to uh, assert my presence and, and, uh, show command presence. Yeah, show command presence. Let people know that uh, I wasn't fucking around, you know. Um, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I was in uniform too. That was a partially uniformed gig. Um, so <laughs> that was uh, that was very interesting. But it was really disappointing to see the lack of lack of uh, response and uh, asset availability from the major defense contractor that I was working for at the time um, at this at this large site. And the lack of response from the government, because um, that contract is under Homeland Security, and no Homeland Security personnel showed up, no U.S. Marshals showed up because they were they kind of had a, a bit of a wheelhouse in that region as well. No one showed up, so I was by myself the entire night, um, which which was uh, pretty bad. Thankfully, nothing happened to the site. I, you know, I kept it protected. A um, little bit of yeah, graffiti on some of the like exterior most walls of the perimeter and stuff, but other than that, nothing else happened. So, yeah. um, but it was just just seeing the just seeing the lack of response from that, and then what happened during during the lockdowns and the kung flu and everything. Uh, very disappointed very disappointed not only in the company but what the government obviously what the government was doing so i i stopped for the time being i have i've stopped doing any any defense or federal contracting um as of uh the beginning of last year i just i couldn't do it couldn't keep doing it yeah i don't blame you i don't think i'd ever want to work for the federal government in any capacity ever again <laughs> yeah pri private private sector for private clients is the way to go because i mean some of the private clients out there, I mean, we're talking Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies, you know, um, right. there's a lot of good opportunity there. So it's, you can, you can do well for yourself and, and still serve, uh, you know, serve your community and serve the country and stuff without having to work for this administration or contract to this administration. Cause we're not, we're not their employees technically, but you know, um, and, 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 and to round it to a part alongside that with the uh being on the ERT team status and everything when the Afghanistan withdrawal happened the team that I was on like we we all got connected we were talking with our company and everything we were getting spun up got all our kit together we were getting spun up met up at the airport we're waiting and waiting and waiting for hours and then came down from the company that State Department said nobody else in or out. They were forcing all the contractors to leave and everything, and, and they were finishing the withdrawal, the pullout. And our company, or the company that I was with at the time, uh, along with another, uh, a number of other companies, left millions and millions and millions of dollars of equipment there. Up-armored Land Cruisers, PKMs, AKs, awful auto, you know, like grenades grenade launchers you name it like everything got left it was just per personnel their bags like paperwork computers the dogs like everything like all that came back everything else got left and uh yeah that was that was really disappointing because i mean i would i would have i really wanted to go there just to help be force protection to help keep h kaya locked down and secure so that proper 
the the proper procedures that the military was doing for vetting vetting Afghan nationals and getting foreign nationals out of the country and stuff could go smoothly, but it turned into what it did. And that, that was, that was the final straw that broke the camel's back. I was like, okay, no, no good. Right. Yeah. Not cool. Oh, so, <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, you, you got anything, uh, anything big coming up your channel soon? Um, nothing too big apart from the occasional, you know, like album drop from any number of the bands that I'm in and some of yeah. those projects and stuff. Um, I would like to here soon, I would like to plan a trip to travel around and link up with a, a bunch of, a bunch of buddies and, and friends that I've made yourself included travel around and, and meet up with everyone and, and do some videos together and do some training and stuff like that. Um, my buddy, Jared, uh, two alpha solutions. He's out in, uh, Virginia, kind of near Pennsylvania, like on the border there. I just did a new business logo for his company. I do business logo design too and stuff. Um, as a, as a quote unquote side hustle, I, know, I like graphic design and stuff, but, um, go out, train with him, do some videos. I need to meet up with uh, a buddy of mine uh, who works as a contractor. Now he was in the Navy, he works as a contractor now over in like, you know, Norfolk, Virginia beach area. I need to go see him. Uh, he just visited me. I need to go see him. I've got, uh, I need to go see Risky Krisky. I need to go see, uh, I need to see you. I need to see another buddy of mine in Mississippi. I need to go see American outlaw or last American outlaw. I need to go link up with him. We've been talking quite a bit. Um, I need to go link up with Trench Grenade, um, even though he's real busy right now. He's he's a drill sergeant of drill sergeants in the Army right now. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe Swamp Dweller, if he's available, like a, like a bunch of people. I need to I need to travel around and, and, and Randall with Grunt Proof. I need to link up with him, too. I need to travel around and link up with a, a bunch of you guys and do some training, hang out have a good time, make some videos, you know, all that. So I think that is in the planning pipeline for 2024 um, is to get some of that done while, while things are good. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, I've been, uh, I was telling fatty, I think yesterday or today that what I'd like to do. Oh, I'd fatty like to too. Like, do what? I would say, Oh, fatty too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought about like maybe if we could all, well, just like have a thing like in maybe northern Tennessee or like West Virginia or something where it's somewhat central, you know, like maybe just have a thing like a, a weekend thing where everybody could come and meet and hang out or something and do some videos of everybody sitting around talking about some topics and stuff like that. I think that'd be really cool. That would be really awesome. I would be very much down to uh, attend a uh... – a uh, a Minuteman convention of sorts. <laughs> yeah, it'd be cool if I like, like some cabins or something, you know, like yeah, some like like they have like in uh, Gatlinburg and stuff like that. But, oh, dude, oh, oh, and Jay, modern modern Minuteman, Jay. Uh, yeah, need to see him too. Um, dude, yeah, you're I way love to him than I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, I'm in. For those that don't know, I'm in the North Midwest. I'm only a couple hours drive from from Canada. So I'm, I'm, I'm up there. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, no, I love, I love the Gatlinburg and like Sevierville Johnson city area of, uh, Eastern Tennessee. It is gorgeous out there. I have another, I have a buddy in Johnson city. He's a uh, former army captain, uh, medic, uh, medic medical corps. Um, good dude. But, uh, hey, I love it out there. It's beautiful. Yeah. I thought, I thought that region would be a good place for everybody to meet. I mean, I know that's probably, further from you than it is from everybody else but uh, yeah it's probably uh that area is about uh because i've done that drive a couple of times it's about a about a 14 15 hour drive for me golly yeah so i'm only like four <laughs> hours from <Gatlinburg. laughs> I'm, a, I'm a road warrior man I, I love long road trips i've driven i've driven from my area down to florida before um with some friends and that took uh 19 hours 20 hours oh my gosh something like that <laughs> yeah yeah it's a good so, time 
<laughs> I did. You no, know, I did. I don't. You got. Think you were on the video I posted today where I talked about the sensationalized, like you know, <laughs> posts or YouTubers. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? Like, is a good strategy for like people who are preparing? Would you Would you agree with like what I said? Like, you know, do a little bit here and there, or or what? Yeah, absolutely, and it it, it depends on where people are too. Because I mean, obviously, a large contingent of people are still in major cities. You know. Um, or yeah, just cities like in general of the American population, something like that lives in urban areas. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, I live in a city too. It's not a, a terribly big city population is about 250,000, um, which grows about 80 K or a little bit more when the large university in the area is in session. But, uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it, urban areas, you know, that's where a lot of people live. Um, so it's the applicability of, preparedness in general and self-reliance while being in that kind of environment in contrast to people in rural environments is going to be different. Mm. So it's like figuring out the applicability there. Cause like the city I'm in is cool. It's a very green city. Um, as far as, uh, uh, topography and wildlife and things like that. Um, there's nothing against, you know, rainwater catchment or, <clears throat> um, some of my neighbors have a chicken, have a small chicken coop in their small backyard, you know, like, um, so there's, there's plenty of that. That's opportunities for people to have a semblance of self-reliance for themselves while still living in that kind of environment. Um, it's not out of the question and, uh, making, making good with, the outlying and surrounding area, you know, having friends that are farmers and things like that in the outlying areas that are relatively easy to get to, but also to network with and work with, that's a good thing too. And, and making friends, like when the farmer's markets are going on in town, you know, like making, making friends with those people, um, because they obviously have resources too, that you can, you can trade and, and share and things like that. Um, there's a number of things and, and community gardens are actually a big thing in my city here too, which is actually a really cool thing to see. Um, so all, all good things there. So there's, there's a lot of those things that people can do to implement for themselves, even, even living in an urban or suburban environment um, as much as for anyone in, in the rural environment that have more opportunity to, um, build up more of and expand on those on, on the various elements of preparedness, you know? Um, whereas like, you know, my neighbors got, I think four chickens in a chicken coop, you know, obviously you can have 50 chickens, you know what I'm saying? Um, so there's a contrast there, but at the same time, you can make it work for yourself. Um, it's just having that drive and want to do that. Um, and, and perceived need to do that for yourself as much as going out of your way to learn new things along the way to, to your advantage. Um, I think it's really what it boils down to. If you could put, and I just thought of this question, I don't have questions written down or anything. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> but, uh, it's all good. <laughs> if you could put like all the like prepper priorities in a, you know, in, in, in a list what what number would you put say like defense or just we'll just say firearms in, in defense or, or for defense what, what what where would you put place that on that priority list um i'd say it's a core fundamental mm -hmm. um having having the having the skills and ability to defend yourself in your home and your family if you have one and things like that like that's that's one of the core fundamentals right up there. <clears throat> it's right up there next to the ability to provide and sustain for yourself. Um, I wouldn't put one above the other, just that they're they're both fundamental things that are essential for someone's preparedness and survivability. And that, yeah, you, you just, you, you need to, you need to get out there and get training and hone and advance those skills to be able to defend what you have uh, in a number of, for a number of different situations and variables, as much as the 
other side of it is on the, on the provisional side with, with resources and uh, sustainability and everything. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to really put it on like a number scale of precedence more so that it's just one of the fundamentals of, of several that you need for yourself. And, and that goes for everyone. Right. Has your, like, has your experience doing contracting work, uh, has that, do you feel like that gives you like a different perspective on like prepping and stuff like that? Maybe like than other people have, like, what, what is, is there things that you could, you know, draw from that, that from those experiences that you might not would have otherwise? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, believe it or not, and I've, and I've actually done a video series. I have a playlist series on my channel for it. Um, I think it's just called preparedness or like logistics and discussions or something like that. Like a big part of it is talking about logistics because with, with contracting and executive protection, we do a lot of what's called advanced work or advanced planning. So that's a lot of area reconnaissance. That's a lot of route planning. That's a lot of that's a lot of uh, taking accountability of resources and assets available to you. Um, a lot of that applicability, apart from the aspects of, of being proficient in mobility, because um, a lot of that is in vehicles, very much vehicle and, and uh, mobility system reliance. Um, and even, even in the Army, it was like that too. You were very much very much a mechanized infantry unit um, when I was in, very much relied on on Humvees to get around, you know. But with and with contracting and executive protection is really no different. You're, you're in vehicles a lot. Um, so the logistical planning and what resources you have and things like that, like having a, a, a much deeper understanding about how to how to uh, plan for in the preparedness sense, how to plan for yourself. Um, has been very valuable um, and is something I'm trying to share and impart with other people. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The logistics thing, it's, it's that can be a big problem, you know, more than <laughs> I think more than uh, people really think about, you know, yep. we want to talk about the tactics and all that and everything, but right. I think the, uh, yeah, the, the biggest problem you're going to run into is some logistical issues. In, a, in an SHTF environment, absolutely, absolutely, and and even in even big army and and contracting companies have logistical problems too. I mean, how many? Can you remember how many times like you were basically black on ammo and there wasn't any resupply coming? Uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. exactly. That stuff happens all the time in the Marine Corps. <laughs> oh yeah, it, it happened all to us budget. too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it happened to us too. So we always had to make sure to scrounge and have extra ammunition and stuff like in our vehicles with us and everything. And and then our 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 patrol packs, our day packs, our assault packs for patrolling. Like we always had extra ammo. I never carried any less than fifteen magazines between on my person and in my pack. And then I had a two hundred three too, so I had all my grenades. And then How I would many also magazines. You say no less than fifteen. Really. Between what's on my person, which was usually, I usually had uh, eight plus one in the gun and then extras in my rock or in my pack, my day pack, and then an extra nut sack of belted ammo for my saw gunner. And then I had my two of my 40 mic mic grenades for my 203. Um, I was carrying all that. Like, yeah, no, no less than that was uh, something that we we picked up real quick well and and had had learned from from the prior deployments of our of our peers and our unit and stuff stuff that uh we learned that we needed and when contracting was no different either we we were armed to the teeth and had a lot of ammo with us as much as we could carry um in case something went wrong you know many magazines what was that <laughs> i said i wish i had i had had at any point that many magazines I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, it's yeah, it, big oof. I mean, even even loose even loose ammo around stripper clips or whatever, like having extra to reload those mags that you do have, you know, like it's it's better to have more than 
what's perceived to be needed because inevitably you're gonna you're gonna run and run through it all you know right you know yeah. and that's one thing i've said too like i did a video one time i think i was talking about uh i think it's a video that fatty found me on and a lot of people found me from this video as well <laughs> on uh how many mags i think it was for the minute man or something like that and i had yeah. just mentioned the fact that I only carried like four mags in her body. Uh, and I could pick it up right now and say that wasn't by choice. <laughs> no, exa- exactly. It was, it was, it was what you were given, you know, and, the- <laughs> yep. you know, and, yeah. and I didn't like some people did, you know, and go to stores and like, there's all kind of, you know, tactical stores off of Campbell's June, but yeah, uh, I didn't go to the stores and buy extra gear. Actually, Back then, if you had a bunch of extra gear like that, like that you had bought, you were made fun of and called a gear queer. I don't know if you ever heard that term or not. I, I, I did. You know, it's funny. Somebody, I feel like somebody had tr- just tried to comment that on one of my channel, on one of my videos lately. I can't remember though. But yeah, no, I've heard that before. And uh, off of uh, Fort Benning, there's this place called Ranger Joe's. Mm-hmm. Um, great retailer and they're still doing very well they have a great online store for anybody that wants to go shop with them yeah Um, the pack that i carry in my videos is from them yep yep and i've i I, uh my my day pack um that i used on patrols i bought at a local px it was one of the original sog bug out gear packs that was retailed in the px's um i've still got that bag and i use it as a range bag i should probably retire it though but uh (laughs) um (laughs) And I, and I, I use that one. Yeah. But like some aftermarket stuff was okayed, but like a lot of it wasn't. And it was, and it was like that in contracting too, is pretty much what you're given. You have to use, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, when it came to like ammunition provision and stuff, you know, this was during the surge, it was big army. So there was money being thrown around like crazy. So they were, they got us what we needed as far as ammo and stuff like that. It was just like, Sometimes the the resupplier logistics pipeline fell apart, you know. So, yeah, people people need to realize even though those logistics are there for the military, even it can fail with them. So, you know, when it comes to the personal, uh, individual or small mag or community sense of logistics and planning, like you really you really got to be squared away with what you got, you know. Right. Yeah. Especially in, in a prepared, you know, citizen context. Uh, you know, there's not somebody supplying that stuff to you. You're, yeah. You're, yeah. And, and I don't know if it was you. Uh, we're talking about somebody was saying it the other day in a video. Uh, you tell me if it was you or not, but something to the effect of uh, you're, you know, back when you're in the military, you're limited, like you were just saying. Like you have yep. to carry a lot of times, you have to carry. I know we were not allowed, like we were, we were it was very strict on us like that. Yeah. Uh, you basically were only to use for the most part, what you were issued unless you snuck stuff in. Uh, yeah. But uh, but for a prepared citizen, like you're not living like that. So you can, you know, everything that's on the market is, you know, you can use. So it's kind of, you're kind of better off in a prepared citizen context than you are in the military in a way. Yeah. In a sense of, of what you can acquire and use. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and again, with contracting too, it it is very much like that. Most of the time it's what you're given. You have to use, you can get, it's a little bit easier to get approval with contracting to use aftermarket equipment and everything or, or whatever. But like, yeah, with, with the army, when I was in, I think the only things that I ever had that weren't issued was my gloves and my day pack, my, my patrol pack, um, that I bought. Everything else was issued. Um, yeah. So those, it was just those two things really. And, and those were two things that they okayed that we could, that we could use whatever, um, for the most part. It had to be, it had to be, you know, AR six seventy dash one compliant, obviously, um, but uh, but there was plenty of aftermarket stuff that was and and still is, so um, that was nice. But yeah, everything else, yeah, absolutely, it was what you were given. You had to use no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, right. So yeah, no, definitely, definitely, uh, uh, civilians, prepared citizens, and stuff have have much better options out there. So. Absolutely. Now I'll tell you, let me ask your opinion on this. Uh, 
this is not a major deal, but uh, uh, gloves. You mentioned gloves. Yeah. Uh, there, there's two things that, that there's two things that everybody talks about. You know, having that are two things that I do not use, and that's <laughs> gloves and hearing protection. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because I didn't use either one of those things when I was in the Marine Corps. Either I didn't wear nope. my gloves and I didn't wear ear pro. Am I? Nope. <laughs> Right, right, <laughs> right. So tell um, me, DJ, am I a turd? <laughs> no, dude, no, I no, don't. I get same thing for me, man. We had the shitty, we had the shitty like inner earplugs because, yeah, when I was in the army, it was before the 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 like peltors that were being issued out to like standard line units. You know, we didn't have that. We had we had the little the the 3M or otherwise the in ear plugs. They didn't work. Or it's not like they didn't work, but it's like you couldn't really hear as good as you needed to. So yeah, we just didn't use them. Um, <laughs> um, and even now, yeah, no, I don't, I don't use, I don't use ears besides like when I'm at the range and stuff. Like I don't, I don't use them. Um, yeah. I'm the same way. Um, gloves, uh, gloves. Sometimes I use them. Sometimes I don't. Um, and when I do, I just use a pair of flight gloves, unless it's. Right the deep of winter because it gets very very cold here um then i'll have to wear winter gloves but otherwise i i don't or yeah i just use flight gloves and i like cut the fingertips off them yeah see i carried uh at one that we had a a guy in my platoon his dad uh taught like girls or he coached like a a girl softball team in louisiana and yeah. uh he sent us some like batting gloves and so oh, okay. sometimes, I mean, they're not real protective, but you know, some of the, that's all the gloves I carried. I had them in my pocket. And the only time I'd even put them on is if we were pulling out concertina wire or <laughs> searching people or something like that. And then I'd take them yeah. right back off because I wanted my, and if, and if I did, and I, I did cut the trigger finger and the thumb out because yep. I wanted to be able to feel that trigger and feel all the, yep. you know, the magazine release and everything. I don't like anything. Yep. I, I don't like anything messing with me being able to, to feel the texture of things and stuff like that. Oh, hundred percent. No, I'm going to say, well, yeah, it was, it, the, I had a pair of the hatch hard knuckle gloves at the time when I was in the army and I cut the fingertips off all the fingers and the thumb and everything. Yeah. Cause exactly. You need that tactile feel, um, which is difficult to have with gloves, even flight gloves. Cause the flight gloves aren't terribly thick, but they're still, you know, goat skin palm and stuff. Um, but yeah, you cut the fingertips off so that yeah, I can feel the trigger, feel my safety, just have that tactile feel. Um, you're gonna be dirty and dealing with gross stuff half, you know, some of the time anyway. It's like whatever, you know, freaking. But you know, you get a little bit of protection, but at the same time, you need to be able to feel things. So no, I'm just, same boat. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good, because I see like these people, you know, like I see other people's videos and they have all this stuff that they're using, and I'm like over here like. Like I'm like, you know, like I was in Vietnam or something. <laughs> like, like none of that, none of the cool guy gear. <laughs> well, and 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 that's a and that's a thing too, because like, you know, for for us for, for us, you know, earlier on in the GWAD and everything, I mean, like Blackhawk and 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 that, like that was the high speed gear, you know, like. Yeah, yeah, black worlds, Hawk. worlds so, apart from what it is now. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like that's like I was talking about with Fatty. Like you know, a lot of the the terminology and and the gear and stuff that was like when I first really started, you know, looking around on YouTube, getting into preparedness and stuff. I didn't know what people were talking about. Like I didn't know what civilians were talking about when they were talking about tactical gear. <laughs> well, and 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 they get some of the uh, colloquialisms and terms they they actually get wrong, you know. Um, yeah. Too. Well, I mean, like with gear and stuff, you know, like there, yeah. the civilians and, and people that were never in the military were were knowing about stuff that we didn't see in Iraq. You know, like we didn't right. see at the time we were in. Right. Right. Yeah, the, the gear development was happening stateside a lot faster than what it was coming to us in the pipeline to us, you know, overseas. Absolutely. Yeah. And like, yeah, it's but like like when people call everything, you know, like like the, the webbing on packs and your your play carrier and stuff, they're calling it Molly, it's pals. It's called pals. You know, yeah. I, I've done a video on that. Like it's a Molly attachment system, but the actual like 
webbing the grid webbing is called pals like it's just things like that it's like okay <laughs> you know yeah. like okay like you I can use it synonymously but... yeah 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 exactly yeah do skier yep <laughs> <laughs> you know it's yeah so it's th there has been a lot of a lot of differences and yeah, I don't, I don't hear, I don't hear the community now. Tell, you know, they don't call plate carriers like Kevlar because it doesn't have Kevlar in it. You know, so they don't call it Kevlar, which is appropriate. But at the, yeah. at, you know, at the same time, I catch myself calling it Kevlar sometimes because, because <laughs> of yeah. the IBA. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on? What are your thoughts on? I'm trying to think of how to word this. Your thoughts on night vision. You've seen my video where I talk about ways of, because I believe you commented on ways to fight without it. Yeah. And, I, and I've said that we didn't even use it a lot of time in Ramadi. Would you say not? I mean, obviously, you, I mean, I don't think anybody would say if you can afford it. Yeah, I get it. But uh, I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But would you consider night vision like a, a requirement for the prepared citizen, you know, the Minuteman type, type of dude? Um, not necessarily. No. Um, it is a very useful piece of equipment, but it's not an essential piece of equipment. Um, I see it as a nicety, not a necessity personally. No, yeah, it's, it's not, it's not essential. Not like, not like having a good reliable weapon is, you know, it's not an essential piece of kit. Um, as, as useful and helpful as it is, it's you, you can do fine without it. I mean, Plenty of examples of uh, individuals doing fine without it, to include the Taliban. So, <laughs> you yeah. know, having yeah, who's in charge of Afghanistan now? <laughs> yeah, sadly, yeah. But having yeah. having uh, having good natural night vision is actually really good, and and a lot of people in rural areas, you know, living out in the sticks, living out in the countryside, you you tend to have better natural night vision than people in the city. Yeah, man, you know, it's weird that you say that because I noticed that, like, my mother-in-law, she's always lived in the city. She comes here from Atlanta, and um, we don't have any uh, – I don't have a security light outside my house. They've offered to put one in, and I said no. One, I don't want that, you know, that – what's the word? Light pollution, I guess you could say. Yeah. Uh, and also for for security reasons, <laughs> they're called security lights, but I don't like them being there because I can't see past them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, so bright lights have, definitely affect your eyesight. Yeah. Yeah. So I've noticed if, if my mother-in-law or somebody comes here that lives in the city or something, I'm outside in the yard doing stuff and they can't see, but I can, you know, that's weird. <laughs> yep. No. And that's, and that's the thing. Yeah. Dude. And, and I've, and I've been between rural and urban environments, you know, my whole life. So I've gone back and forth, but, but I have pretty, pretty damn good eyesight still. So my my natural night vision is good, but it's not as good as it used to be. But it's still pretty good, so I can I can get by pretty well. Probably not as good as like you or like my buddy in Mississippi or some of these other people, but but uh, I can still do still do well with it. But I do I do have night vision, and uh, should the situation arise where I would need to use it, you know, I have it. But it's very exigent when it comes to night vision on when you need to use it. There's not a lot of common situations where you're going to need night vision. Right. Me personally, I only ever used it. And I also feel like I would do the same thing in an SHTF scenario is that I would really only use it if I was static, like if I was standing post or something like that. When I was moving around, I don't like to have it on. Right. Right. Yeah. Certain, certain exigent operations. But other than that, yeah, no, definitely. I, I, 100%. Hundred percent. Yeah, uh, and and I know night vision nowadays is probably a lot better than the night vision I have experience with. But, uh, yeah, I I got a smoking deal on a Gen two plus level three uh, monocular not terribly long ago, and it is worlds better than the PBS fourteen I was using when I was in the army. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So I much remember better. 
that's why we didn't use them because they're like with Jack, your depth perception up and be tripping over stuff and running yep. into stuff. And that's why I always hated night vision, but I know that's probably not the case now. And I, to be honest, yeah. so I've never used anything other than PBS 14. Well, yeah, yeah, the new, the newer gen PBS 14s are really, they're, they're nice, man. Yeah. Your, your depth perception doesn't get nearly as jacked up now. Um, but yeah, that, back then yeah that was a big issue is depth perception and trying to drive with those on god no wonder we had so many goddamn accidents <laughs> couldn't couldn't tell what was going on you know you did you just said no depth perception um and so tell me because i don't know because i haven't looked too much into night vision to be honest yep. uh shame on me i know no that's uh, all right it's all right but uh and I know that there's other people out there that might have this question, so maybe you can answer it. Where is a place, and for like, and for what price? What's the cheapest I could get something like that? Like, not like one of these Amazon things. Like, you know, like I know Jay did it with that. I don't remember what the brand was, but I did the same thing he did. So I had the yeah. little night vision camera or whatever. And yeah, it works. But uh, digital, yeah, and that's and that's a digital unit, um, which which is fine. They they work pretty well um, for what they are you know um yeah which is cool for for tube or analog night vision like your pbs 14 and stuff nowadays probably the low end probably 1500 1600 and then obviously much higher than that um that's what i was saying so probably some income tax money (laughs) yeah absolutely absolutely um they're an investment that's for sure especially especially when you're getting to some of the the gen three and even the gen four units that are coming out now and stuff like that's, that's, that's money, you know? So, um, but I got mine at a smoking deal for like 1500. Um, so that's another thing, you know, people need to look for the deals because if a good one comes along for a a solid unit, like if you don't want to, if you don't want to skip on it, you know, it's, that would be the time to pick it up. But um, if, if it's something that you feel you want, you know, but, um, average, average for a PBS 14 nowadays is probably about 2,200 to 3,600, somewhere in there. Yeah. That's a lot. It is. It's not cheap. <laughs> that's, that's, that's two rifles, you know? Yeah. I think that's probably the biggest thing that keeps people from night vision is the price. It is, um, very much so. Um, yeah, now again, you can go the digital route and, and get a digital unit for considerably less, but, uh, it does have its, it does, it does have its, uh, limitations, but you can make it work for you, you know, um, like you and Jay have, like you can make it work for you. Um, so yeah, it just, just depends on what your, what your intended use is and, and the applicability uh, situation planning wise and things like that is for it along with you know, what you can afford and stuff. So, cause it's, it, there is quite the, quite the range of price there. So. Right. So do you have any, uh, any ideas? Like what do you think is the most likely scenario that people should be prepared for? That's a good question. I actually got that for my last Q and a not that long ago. Um, cause I do like a monthly Q and a uh, answer video. I'm going to start doing them as live streams cause I haven't been, but I'm going to start doing them as live streams. But, um, apart from natural disasters, cause that is definitely the first and foremost based on the region that you're in, what natural disasters are an, an effect that you need to properly plan for. Cause we see how many people don't plan for them and then, you know, bad things happen. And they lose everything and, and don't have anything to fall back on. Um, apart from natural disasters, I think with just the current status of things, I think the two things that people need to plan for, well, three things that people need to plan for are in order of severity, the uh, most severe being a, a total economic uh, depression or collapse um, would be one. Um I mean, we saw I, getting out of the army in 2008 when the housing bubble thing happened, that was bad. Um, so I, I knew quite a few people, friends, and then, you know, friends, families and stuff who ended up losing their houses and shit when that happened. Um, 
And we're kind of at an apex point right now with the bubble that's probably going to pop and it's going to be a lot worse than what it was in 2008, much more akin to what happened during the, uh, the twenties, 1920s. Um, so that uh, economic, uh, a severe economic collapse or, or depression of sorts from there. I don't, I don't want to say uh, a domestic civil conflict. I don't know the severity or risk factor with that as of right now. It, it's hard to tell. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's going to take a couple of significant events for something to catalyze that turning into something that can actually happen. Yeah, um, I don't think people are ready for that smoke. No, they're not. And, and that's the other <laughs> thing. People are not ready for that either. Um, I think the other thing, though, which is just global war, full-scale war. Um, we are very, very, very close to uh, getting involved in another, another global conflict, apart from the continuing GWAT and uh, the other involvement in conflicts, proxy wars and stuff that we have going on right now as a nation. Um, we're, we're very, we're very close to getting involved in another war and statistically more democratic administrations have declared a war or been involved in wartime than Republican, uh, administrations take that right. for what it is too. Um, right. <laughs> so <laughs> I think we're I think we're pretty close to that. Um, the atomic clock is closer than it's ever been to nuclear threat, and apart from that, just we're seeing what's happening on the diplomatic and geopolitical and global economic scales with BRICS and everything else that's going on in in China and Russia and everything that's in Iran and North Korea. There's very possible that something is going to happen in the next couple of years. Right. Especially depending on what administration comes in office in the next election. <laughs> right. Uh, and there's that, there's that question too, like Risky was asking, will there be a next election? <laughs> you know, and I don't know. <laughs> yeah, will, I don't they know. Try, will they try and uh, pull something before then and, and put us into a conflict? Who knows? Yeah. Um, Nothing surprises me anymore. No, honestly, no. <laughs> it's just, I mean, you and I and a number of our, our friends and other people are, are ready for, generally ready for whatever, you know? So it's grabbing yeah, the popcorn, and waiting and seeing. That's right. Like, <laughs> and I know, too, like, the thing that sucks, and I don't think, I don't think I've really said it on YouTube, but I, I think I might have said something to you about it, and I know I've said something to the rest, to the, uh, Risky's Raiders crew with our little Instagram group. Yeah. But uh, unfortunately, over the last year or so, uh, I, I kind of got burned out, you know, from time to time. Cause I think there was just so much happening, you know, like over the last several years that it was just like, you know, I lo almost I lost interest in prepping, you know, several yeah. times. And, you know, I, I, I guess it's just burnout, you know, because there's just been so much go on. It's been like hard to keep up with. And, yeah, to decide, you know, where do I need to focus my preparedness efforts? It's it, it's been difficult. <laughs> absolutely, oh, one hundred percent. It's and and part of part of what I do now for work, you know, I have to look in the geopolitical, the the global sphere of things because I do, you know, threat assessments and risk assessments and stuff as part of my job as a, as a security consultant and advisor. Um, so I'm, I'm constantly looking at information and utilizing tools and data and everything to see what's going on, you know, and, and how also with seeing all that kind of influences, uh, what I'm doing preparedness wise and things like that. But at the same time, it is information overload for everyone right now, just with the media and everything. And that's why I've been saying it in recent videos. It's like, Hey, it's okay to put your phone away and go outside for a couple of days and just be, you know, just take in the fresh air and the view and not, not, uh, 
not be constantly tied to that stream of information now um as important as it is like at the same time like it burns you out absolutely and you you either become super anxious or you just lose motivation or both you know and and it's very detrimental to your to your well-being and and you're just your your wellness and your focus and everything else so it's like being able to being able to separate from that at from time to time and just go relax and spend time out in the woods or with your family and friends whoever whatever like that's really important it is more and more important as time goes on with how technology and information flow is now um, for people to do that and set that aside. And I know that you lately have been doing uh, quite a bit as far as uh, uh, meditation and things like that, which uh, I really, I really like to hear. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's definitely not healthy to, <laughs> you know, to be worried about things all the time. It'll definitely uh, end up physically affecting you as well. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and, and I've got, I've got friends in Ukraine too. I have Ukrainian friends and then I have uh, expat friends who are in Ukraine and uh, I don't, I don't care about people's political views on the whole situation or whatever, you know, I'm not, I don't take sides with it. I just worry yeah. about my friends you yeah. know, and, uh, yeah, and that's apart from everything else I do in the professional sphere and everything. And then taking that for how it applies for me personally and just preparedness and stuff. But it's just like, yeah, there's, there's a lot out there that is just induces anxiety and you see it in the community too, overall. Um, you, Kind of like with the video that you did today about like all these clickbaity prepper channels and uh, the product shilling that they do and the the clickbait titles and everything that they're doing, like that does not help the community's mental wellness and 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 whatnot as well. It doesn't. No, and I'll tell you, and I'll say it on here: full spectrum survival. That was the one that made me do that video. <laughs> I know him. Yeah, him. I think Canadian prepper black. Uh, I used to like Black, Black Scout Survival, but he's gotten like that too. And yeah, like, there's, he's, there's he's bad about it too a lot. Like, yeah. yeah, he did it the other day. Uh, I think yeah. it was last night. Was went live and and I got on there and he was just promoting stuff. It wasn't yeah. anything to do with. He maybe spent two minutes out of twenty. Yeah. Talking about what the title was actually about. Right. <laughs> right. And 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 just yeah, the sensationalist titles and everything. Like it's just like, dude. I, yeah, I don't, I don't watch those kinds of channels, you know, like I'm instead I watch like you, I watch, you know, our boy Krisky, I watch, you know, Jay, like all these guys, like that's, that's who I'm watching and who I'm talking with and survivor metal man. Love that guy. You know, like, like, you know, our, our, and like I said before, kind of our underground community within the broader community that is on YouTube doing all this stuff. Um, yeah. Because we keep, we need to keep a realist, uh, a realistic mindset and a sensible approach to how we do things, even in content or videos. I don't really like the word content, but in the videos that we do, you know, like, yeah, sensationalism doesn't do anything except make people more anxious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I'd say, uh, I was going to say something about the better. Oh, losing you there a little bit, brother. Your mic, your mic. I'm losing you, brother. Your mic is popping. You there? There. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, you just came back. Sorry, your mic cut out there. It was popping a little bit. Uh, sorry. Okay, yeah, I was saying, like, when you mentioned earlier about, like, this sort of underground community, uh, yeah. it's kind of funny because I was, I was looking at my, on my channel, my list, uh, my featured channels list, my, my homies, <laughs> which you will be added to now. Uh, <laughs> I appreciate uh, you. Because I, I don't add anybody until we actually get a video or something out, you know, or a podcast sure. or whatever. 
But sure. uh, and I was thinking, how did how did all of us, you know, this was all, like it was all sort of organic, you know what I mean? Like none of us were out trying to. I don't think trying to build like this like alternative like YouTube prepper community. I think yeah. everybody just kind of found each other and then through the comment section and stuff like that and got, kind of got to know each other and it's really cool. And uh yeah. I, I've seen I've seen some bigger channels and I'm not going to mention no names on this because there's one huge one and I don't and I don't dislike him. I actually have talked to him before, but I've noticed that some things that we're saying seems to be getting on the radar of some of the bigger channels and yes uh, I think we're making an impact in ways that some of these bigger channels don't like yeah absolutely i mean there's there's a because we're we're bringing not only knowledge and experience you know to the table but also keeping that sensible approach and maybe maybe looking at it from a different set of eyes instead of the set of eyes that some a lot of the larger channels are you know um i th i think I, I i it's beneficial it's a good thing and especially if it is kind of bleeding into some of the larger channels that have a lot more uh a lot more influence and exposure in uh viewer viewer community and just the the this type of community in general i think it's a good thing but at the same time yeah if it is ruffling some feathers well, guess what? Experiences vary, you know? Right. Um, something that works for, say, a special operations guy who's doing a lot of CQB and uh, CQC and raids, and I say CQC, not CQB, or I call it MOUT, Military oh, Operations and Urban Terrain. <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's CQC, Close Quarters Combat, you know? I don't know where the CQB thing came from, but, uh, yeah. um, you know, somebody who's doing a lot of that, that is starkly different from experiences of guys who have done a lot more out there field operations, you know, or guys who have done other types of uh, fringe work and paramilitary operations and things like that. Like there's a big, there's a big difference between all of them. Now there is obvious crossover and there's definitely things that we can learn from each other, you know? So Anybody, anybody who's going to put somebody else's valid and applicable experiences into a negative light is only doing themselves and the community as a whole a disservice, you know? Um, well, I think sometimes it's because, you know, things that we might say might go against what they say that, you know, helps them promote their, their brand or sell their specific item that people don't really need. <laughs> Absolutely. It, that that is absolutely the case uh, with some with some people in channel. Absolutely, um, challenges their bullshit. Yeah, it, which is good because there should be that challenge there, in a in a constructive way. But there should be that challenge there because because again, you know, some things don't work, and some things do work, and some things require adaptation as whatever goes along. You know, like. And you're seeing you're seeing a revival, or, or or I should say a resurgence, maybe not revival, but a resurgence of your '90s and early 2000s infantry tactics in an applicable active war right now. Right, you're seeing it. You're not seeing necessarily as much of like the high speed urban stuff even though there is applicability there, obviously, yeah. but, but you're not, you're not seeing, you're not seeing that you're seeing guys wearing load bearing equipment systems, carrying a lot of necessary ammunition because of their extended fights and extended uh, assault operations and things like that, where, and reconnaissance and things like that, that is, it's, it's necessary, which I like seeing. Um, because I, I personally think a lot of that from the time we were in and then a little bit earlier before that, like, I think that definitely has some universal applicability no matter how far along time has gone because it just works, you know? Right. You're, if you or anybody out there is a, a Fallout fan, war, war never changes. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so yeah, yeah. I, I noticed uh, one of the big YouTubers a while back. I think it was it was a while ago when I when I first had the conversation with Risky Christie on the podcast. Yeah. And then I turned it to video format, and I posted it. And one of the biggest YouTubers uh, in the preparedness community, not long after, maybe a week or two after, he came out with a video. Uh, and it was seemed really like like his feathers were really ruffled about <laughs> something, and uh, saying you know there's a, there's a lot of new uh, prepper channels popping up that are saying this and this this and it was something exactly that me and Risky Christie were talking about that was not <laughs> wrong and no one was in their right mind could argue against. <laughs> right, right. But I believe it was something that was uh, you know. Uh, challenging uh you know the, the bull crap <laughs> like what we were talking about right you know and that's uh, yeah that's funny that's funny because like you guys are on point about it and yeah that's the thing even um i'm gonna shout out uh soe gear special operations equipment gear um those guys have been in the, the tactical nylon uh tactical equipment and, and apparel textile industry game for a long time um, I love those guys though. Cause, cause like John and Scully, they tell it how it is, you know, those two, those are two like old school Marines, you know, and they're talking about like, Hey, guess what? You're going to need to carry as much fucking ammo as you can. And, you know, things like that, like the LBV and the LBE systems and, and, uh, uh, large capacity chest rigs and stuff like that is the way, you know, um, running and as you know from experience running a minimalist four magazine rig is not going to do you much good right yeah and i will say oh that's something i was going to add to that <laughs> is that the fact that if we didn't have machine guns i would have been screwed only carrying that much ammo right right you know, most of the time we just take cover behind the trucks and light everything up with machine gun fire and not even use our rifles, you know, despite what people think. Some people say, well, this isn't a war like in Iraq where it's all CQB. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of the fighting that we did was not even in the houses we were clearing. You know, it was like blocks down the street, you know, for yep. a rooftop. Yep, absolutely. So, yeah, it was. And if it were for, those, for that machine gun fire, those four magazines would have not served me very well. Right. No, I, there was there was a few rooftop firefights that we got into that were uh, one of the, I think the longest firefight I was in. That was a fourteen hour firefight. Yeah. Um, and I went black on ammo. Um, but a lot of the time, up until they stopped allowing they they stopped permitting it per ROE and stuff that bullshit. Till they stopped permitting it in Baghdad and stuff. Like I was using my two or three my 40 mic mics a lot more like <laughs> oh yeah we, we we whip out the street sweeper sometimes start lobbing grenades you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh yeah you guys yeah you guys have the mill core yeah 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 we were uh i believe that we were we got one of the first ones to test out that's awesome a big old grenade revolver <laughs> yeah that thing's sweet dude <laughs> that's awesome or mark yeah. 19 <laughs> yep yep mark 19 yeah we had we had it was like every it was like every fourth third fourth humvee we had a mark 19 on it yeah. you know a couple mod deuces 240s and then the mark 19 yeah we would stage it out between vehicles yeah um yeah i used my 203 quite a bit um and then like areas outside of the baghdad area like yeah i was using that a lot um i miss Believe that it thing. or not we had a wall Oh yeah, yeah. They're still yeah. making them. Yeah, sometimes people don't believe me, and I'm oh, I swear we had like a, we yeah. had a law. <laughs> yeah, they're like on like the like twelfth iteration of a model of it, but yeah, we still we still use them. Yeah, um, that's the only one I'd ever seen before, but we had one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where it came from. Somebody acquired. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. We- <laughs> <laughs> Tactical acquisition, that's a uh, important <laughs> skill. <laughs> right? 
But uh, I got to cut it off. Uh, my walk's about to go to work, and I got to get back in the house with the kids. But uh, all right, <laughs> I was glad to have you back on. Maybe the audio's not messed up this time. And uh, anybody who's listening, if you're not subscribed to DJ, uh, head over to his channel, DJ the Metalhead Mercenary, and give him a subscribe. He's one of the homies. Uh, are you anywhere? Where else are you other than YouTube? YouTube's not it, is it? Um. Actually, yeah, I uh, I don't really use social media otherwise. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, but only for professional segs, uh, segues. Yeah, um, I need to get on there and accept you on there. <laughs> yeah, yep, yep. Just for the for the professional space, uh, for job jobs and stuff, I'm on there. But no, otherwise, just LinkedIn. Um, uh, you know, you know, my bunch of my bands that I'm in, like they're on like Bandcamp and stuff. Um. A couple of like you know Spotify and other stream major streaming platforms, but social media wise, yeah, I'm not on anything else besides uh, YouTube. And then uh, I am on Discord. I'm in like Trench Grenades Discord channel and and uh, Wired Tights his Discord channel um, and a couple other channels. Um, but other than that, yeah, I'm not on social media at all. So um, and I like it that way. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, people can, you know, hear your, I know you've posted your stuff on YouTube with the music and everything, right? So people can yep. find it through there as well. Yep, yep, yeah. most of it's linked uh, linked on YouTube, yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah, this has been the longest conversation I've had on podcast, but I've enjoyed it. I lost track of time. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, brother, it was, a, it was a great time. I really appreciate you having me on, man. Yeah, I'm going to get, I'd like to get you back on. I want to, you know, like I said the last time, I want to kind of do these initial conversations, kind of introduce everybody and then get into some more, uh, you know, focused topics where we actually, you know, have a, you know, preset topic we want to talk about and then get back on and talk about only that thing. Absolutely. So you'd be willing to do that. Oh, yeah. I'm down anytime, man. Awesome. All right, man. Well, I'll we'll get this uploaded and, uh, and it was good talking to you and we'll talk to you again. Hey, likewise, brother. Thank you very much. Everyone, go check out Fortner's Frontier Leather. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, <laughs> metal up. All right. Take it easy, man. Later. If you enjoyed this episode of Modern Frontiersman, the podcast, and you would like to support it, please be sure to head over to patreon.com slash modern frontiersman. That is the number one way that you can support the work that we're doing here and promoting self-reliance and encouraging people to get back uh, to living as a modern frontiersman. As always, stay self-reliant. Are you a modern frontiersman, an outdoorsman? You still live that traditional old school lifestyle? Are you a hunter, trapper, a working cowboy? a traditional craftsman, a farmer, a homesteader. And have you ever wondered if there is anybody out there that still makes traditional leather products for people like you? Well, there is. I'm Josh at Modern Frontiersman, and I also have a company called Fortner's Frontier Leather. When I first got into self-reliance and um, living this type of lifestyle, I didn't really like any of the factory made stuff that was out there, gun belts and all the uh, rifle slings and all those kind of things. So I started making them myself by hand with traditional centuries old techniques uh, with no machinery or anything in my workshop. And if you would like to head over to FortnersFrontierLeather.com, I can make those products for you. Gun belts, holsters, knife sheaths, rifle slings, work aprons, whatever you might need to live the life of a modern frontiersman. FortnersFrontierLeather.com Once upon a time, there were Americans who lived out on the frontier. In between civilization and wilderness. They didn't have the modern conveniences that we have today to make us weak. They had to live fairly self-reliant lives. They didn't have government close by that they could depend on for all their needs. They didn't have stores that they could just go to whenever their heart desired something. We're trying to make a change here at Modern Frontiersman. 
and encourage people to live somewhat like the frontiersmen of the past and stay self-reliant. If you enjoyed this episode of Modern Frontiersman, the podcast, and you would like to support it, please be sure to head over to patreon.com slash modernfrontiersman. That is the number one way that you can support the work that we're doing here and promoting self-reliance and encouraging people to get back uh, to living as a modern frontiersman. As always, stay self-reliant. Are you a modern frontiersman? An outdoorsman? You still live that traditional old school lifestyle? Are you a hunter, trapper, a working cowboy, a traditional craftsman, a farmer, a homesteader? And have you ever wondered if there is anybody out there that still makes traditional leather products for people like you? Well, there is. I'm Josh at Modern Frontiersman, and I also have a company called Fortner's Frontier Leather. When I first got into self reliance and um, live in this type of lifestyle. I didn't really like any of the factory made stuff that was out there, gun belts and all the uh, rifle slings and all those kind of things. So I started making them myself by hand with traditional centuries old techniques uh, with no machinery or anything in my workshop. And if you would like to head over to FortnersFrontierLeather.com, I can make those products for you. Gun belts, holsters, knife sheaths, rifle slings, work aprons, whatever you might need to live the life of a modern frontiersman, FortnersFrontierLeather.com. Once upon a time, there were Americans who lived out on the frontier, in between civilization and wilderness. They didn't have the modern conveniences that we have today to make us weak. They had to live fairly self-reliant lives. They didn't have government close by that they could depend on for all their needs. They didn't have stores that they could just go to whenever their heart desired something. We're trying to make a change here at Modern Frontiersmen and encourage people to live somewhat like the frontiersmen of the past and stay self-reliant.